Welcome to Palm Sunday and this first day of Holy Week. We invite you this week to journey with us as we journey with Christ to the cross. We're glad you're here with us and worship now, and we pass the peace of Christ to you and invite you to light a candle as we begin worship together. Join with me in a Palm Sunday call to worship from the prophet Zechariah in the ninth chapter of the book that bears his name. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Let all prepare for the arrival of Jesus. Join me responsively in a reading of Psalm 118. Give thanks to God for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. God has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Blessed is he who comes in the name of God. From the house of God we bless you. God is God and he has made his light shine upon us. With palm boughs in hand, join in the procession up to the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to God, 
for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. This is the first day of Holy Week, the biggest week of the church year. It's on this Sunday that our focus narrows from the broad themes of self-reflection, almsgiving and fasting, to now experiencing the journey of Christ. Holy Week invites us to put ourselves in Jesus' shoes, to experience his journey to the cross, and to also ask ourselves what this journey means to us. Holy Week always starts with Palm Sunday, one of the most beautiful experiences Jesus has on earth, as he's welcomed into Jerusalem with a palm parade, the only time in his earthly ministry that he's recognized as a king. I imagine the story that we are focusing on today happening right before Jesus enters Jerusalem, right before the palm parade, where people will cry, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. So listen now to our scripture reading for today from John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. This is the word of the Lord. Two months ago, I was as close to my own death as I have ever been in my life so far. Severe pain in my abdomen landed me in the emergency room. By the time my intake and time in the waiting room concluded, I was back in a small examination room waiting for the doctor to come in, and I was oddly feeling much better. The pain that had had me on my knees at home had receded and was almost completely gone. What I was feeling at the time in the ER as I began to feel better was really silly for going in and wasting the doctor's time. And as I watched the clock strike midnight, I was sure that I was fine and that I should just go home. The doctor had other plans. He disagreed with me and set me on a course for five hours of testing through the middle of that night that led to a diagnosis of ovarian cancer, likely stage three, or four, he said. In a moment, the plans I had been making for my life were upended by thoughts of my own death. As a pastor, I'm well acquainted with illness and death. I've sat with so many who have gotten news like the news I was facing in the ER that night, so I was no stranger to what this diagnosis could mean for me and my family. All of a sudden, for what I realized was truly the first time in my life, I could not ignore the truth that death is inevitable and that one day I'm going to die. 
Something changes when we become aware that we're going to die. Something happens when that knowledge moves from our head down to our gut. Now, as many of you know, it turns out that the large tumors in my abdomen were actually endometriosis instead of cancer. But in the weeks that the doctors were sure that it was cancer, all the big plans I had previously made stopped in an instant, and new, much smaller plans replaced them. Plans for surgery and recovery. Plans for covering my duties at work and taking care of our children. Plans for living in the moment, writing notes to all my loved ones and savoring what was right in front of me. Because at that time, that was all I knew I really had. In the first few days of thinking I had cancer, I said to my husband, all of a sudden, in an instant, I feel like nothing matters and everything matters all at the same time. I imagine that this was how Jesus and Lazarus and Mary and Martha felt in the story that we just read. This is the story of a dinner party, and it's sandwiched in John's gospel between two deaths, between the death of Lazarus on one end and the death of Jesus on the other. Not more than a handful of days before this dinner party takes place, Lazarus, who was Mary and Martha's brother, was pronounced dead. He was gravely ill, and Mary and Martha knew that without some sort of miracle, he was going to die, and so they had sent a friend to go and find Jesus, who they felt was their only hope at saving their only brother. Jesus was doing important things when this news came. He was surrounded by crowds and tending to some other things, and he told the messenger that he would come see Lazarus as soon as he could. And he asked the messenger to tell Mary and Martha not to worry that this wasn't the kind of illness that leads to death. But by the time Jesus arrives to see Lazarus, he's already been dead for four days. Now you'll remember that, of course, Jesus does indeed bring Lazarus back to life. And Jesus tells us he does so for the sake of building the faith of all those who would witness this miracle and all those who would hear about it. Jesus goes to Lazarus' tomb and in the name of God asks Lazarus to come out and Lazarus comes out, a real life dead man walking. He walks out of his tomb, burial clothes unraveling behind him, the stench of death still surrounding him. And Jesus tells those that are with him to unbind him and set him free because he's alive. So this dinner party was planned to celebrate the new life that Lazarus had been given. A week past Lazarus's death, and a week before his own death, Jesus is at the table, sharing a meal with his closest friends to give thanks for what God has done. Martha is preparing the meal, as she does. Judas is trying to catch anyone he can doing wrong, as he does. Lazarus is there, but he doesn't say a word, likely still in shock to have experienced death and to now be alive. And Mary does the strangest thing of all. Mary finds a clay jar of perfume, and she brings it to the dinner table. Now, this is not the kind of perfume that you put on when you're going out. This is the kind of perfume that was reserved for bodily preparation after death. Perhaps it's left over from the oil that was purchased when Mary and Martha prepared Lazarus's body for burial. So Mary takes this jar of oil. She kneels down beside Jesus. She takes down her hair and she anoints Jesus' feet with the oil, then drying them with her hair. Can you imagine a scene like this? This incredibly intimate and loving act immediately makes others uncomfortable. It kind of makes me uncomfortable to read about it. I can't imagine experiencing it firsthand. This radical act of love interrupts the dinner 
a party that is actually being held in someone else's honor, not in honor of Jesus. But this radical act of love actually replaces the smells of dinner with the smells of burial and end of life. This moment of celebrating that Lazarus is alive is turned into a moment of realizing that Jesus is going to die. Judas sees this act of radical love and tries to present himself as holier than this messy scene. For his own ends, of course, we know, because he wants to take the money. He says, why are you wasting this expensive oil on Jesus' feet? This oil could have been sold and the money could have been given to the poor. Now Jesus, defender of the poor, the one who has been pressing everyone to love each other, especially when it pushes us outside of our comfort zones, doesn't agree with Judas in this case and says to him, leave her alone. The poor will always be with you, but I will not be. While Judas is technically right about the oil, he's missing the point of this act of love. It's easy to do when an act of love is so jarring, so beautiful, and so extravagant. But the point of this story isn't found through reasonable logic. The point of this story is to give us a tangible example of what extraordinary love looks like. This is the kind of love Jesus had been proclaiming from the beginning of his ministry. This is a mirror to what God's love looks like. Love that cannot be boxed in by right actions performed at right times. The kind of love that isn't best understood by reading a long list of rules and regulations and following them. This act of love is transformational at its very core. It transforms the giver, it transforms the receiver, and it transforms all who witness it and hear about it. In the Gospel of John, the old phrase, seeing is believing, is turned upside down again and again. John actually uses the word believing 10 times more often than the other Gospel writers, and two times more often than Paul. It's John's gospel where we see Jesus say, believe in God and believe also in me. It's in John that Jesus also says, believe in the light so that you may become children of the light. And then he says, don't just believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe even when they haven't seen me. Belief in John is not an intellectual pursuit. It's not about a well-crafted creed or coming up with a complex and complete set of rules to live by. Belief in John is always a verb. To believe is to live out your faith in action. Theologians throughout time have tried to parse out what it was that Mary actually believed. In all the accounts of Mary's presence in the Gospels, she never explains who Jesus is with words. She doesn't tell anyone what she thinks about God even. Instead, again and again, Mary lives out her belief through her loving actions. She believes by sitting at Jesus' feet as he teaches. She believes by running to Jesus first when her brother has died. And she believes as she lavishly anoints Jesus' feet in the days before his death, preparing him for what was to come. Our Lenten journey this year has been an immersion in this kind of love. Each week, we've tried to define what love looks like. It looks like forgiveness, serving, inclusion, empathy, and love looks like sacrifice. And this Holy Week, we take the final journey to love, lived out through action. The love we'll experience this week will be shared around a table with a bread and cup. The love we experience this week will be poured into a wash basin by the Son of God, who will then wash the feet of those he loved in preparation for the journey that was ahead of them. It will be love that is lived out 
as Jesus carries his cross, the instrument of his own death, to the hill where he will die. The love we experience this holy week costs something. This is the kind of love that is so hard to bear at times that it will lead Peter to deny the one he loves most, not once but three times. This love is so transformational that it will make us uncomfortable because it deeply desires to uproot institutions that oppress others. And that's what makes Judas reject it and turn on Jesus to betray him in the hopes of getting more power. And ultimately, this Holy Week love is so heartbreaking that Jesus will weep in anticipation of what is to come. And he will die to show us how committed he is to this kind of transformational love. What's maybe most shocking of all that will happen this week is that Jesus will also ask us to do the same. Mary's radical and gorgeous act of love feels inappropriate to us because we like to try and control our love. Giving away love isn't easy, and receiving love is just as hard. Mary doesn't tell us to love with a well-crafted sermon or five su suggestions of how to live a loving life. Mary shows us how to do love, how to make love a verb. Mary lives out love by listening to the Holy Spirit who guides her to anoint Jesus' feet with oil. Mary also lives out love by sacrificing something that was worth something to her, that expensive burial perfume. Mary also lives out love by interrupting well-crafted dinner plans to give Jesus a gift that fills him with love as he is about to journey into the hardest week of his life. So, this Holy Week, Mary's example of radical belief as seen through her loving actions will be our guide. This Holy Week, we too are being called to put belief and love into action. So first, may we take intentional time with God to ponder what love looks like in our own context. Jesus gave us a hint about the shape this love should take by telling us to feed his sheep, to care for the orphans and the widows, to root out oppression wherever it lives, and to welcome that one lost sheep back home. Second, may that pondering we do with God guide us into loving action. May we not get paralyzed by the thought of doing love right, but instead, May we follow Mary's lead and follow Jesus' lead to live out love moment by moment and day by day, taking the next right step with God. I don't think Mary woke up the morning of that dinner party thinking, I'm going to anoint Jesus' feet with oil tonight. I think Mary responded to what the moment needed and to the Holy Spirit's nudging in her heart to care for her friend, Jesus. The last way that we do love now is to live into the awareness that we don't have all the time in the world. Death is coming. It is inevitable. Ultimately, we won't be able to avoid it, and we can't escape it. So may the reality that we too will someday die be the key to living love fully today, in the here and now. So happy Holy Week. Let the journey of transformational love begin. Amen.
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This Holy Week, we invite you to take the journey to the cross with us. It begins on Monday, Thursday with a tenebrae service at noon and another at 6.30 p.m. here in our sanctuary. On Good Friday, you're welcome to come to the building to experience our outdoor self-guided prayer pilgrimage at a time that works best for you. And on Easter Sunday, we have four worship in-person options for you to choose from a sunrise service at 6.30 a.m. at Wyzetta Beach, 8 a.m. communion service in the chapel, and worship in the sanctuary at 9 and 10.30 a.m. Please visit our website to RSVP for any of these services. As we've walked through COVID together, we want to thank you for joining us for Worship Online. It has been a time of learning and growth for all of us. And as we transition to in-person gatherings starting Easter Sunday, our online format will change. We'll be live streaming services from our sanctuary at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. each week. Parables will continue to worship online through the end of May. Now, as we enter into this holy week together, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit lead the way for what does the Lord require of us but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Amen. Go in peace.